is really one of uh, uh, my favorite projects, I would say. <laughs> having uh, founded this company about five years ago and having been running now for four years in a row. Um, and I have to say, the, the Food Tech 500 is really where, when we try to, to bring together the whole, uh, the whole community and, uh, and make sure that uh, we can, uh, if the mic f yeah, works, <laughs> and we can really celebrate uh, uh, in the best way possible uh, the global entrepreneurial talent at the intersection of food and technology. But before I get into that, uh, and I know that we have a very packed agenda, so apologies if I speak pretty fast to make sure that we can uh, uh, get all the content in. I just wanted to get a, 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 a hands you know, raised for the entrepreneurs that today we have in the room. Fantastic. I'm going to do the same streaming. Uh, if you can uh, type in the comment chat, uh, if you're an entrepreneur, an investor, a corporate executive, a food tech, food tech enthusiast, you're going to see it later. Um, we welcome you know, anyone who's also interested in the world of agri-food tech, but might not you know, be running a company necessarily or might not be working yet you know, in this industry. Uh, but before, uh, I, I just wanted to, you know, kind of understand uh, who we have in the room today and who, also who we have online uh, to help you guys also level up a bit, you know, the knowledge as uh, I'm going to be talking about quite a lot of things <laughs> and uh, I want to make sure that, you know, everyone, you know, in, in, is basically on the same page as us. But uh, without further ado, let me just jump straight into uh, today's agenda. Uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, quite a lot on the plate. Uh, we're going to start with uh, a bit more, to, to hear a bit more about the Food Tech 500. Uh, I'll give you, try to give you also a bit of the genesis of how it started and uh, what we have learned really along the way, uh, working in the sector now for about a decade. Uh, then we're going to go and move forward and have uh, actually some international speakers that have uh, joined us today uh, to share with you also what they see, you know, in their local ecosystems. Uh, we're then going to be uh, moving on to showcasing some of the top-ranked companies of uh, the 2022 Food Tech 500 that are actually based in Spain. Uh, the idea being that uh, this event is the first one of a series that is going to take the Food Tech 500 of a, on a tour. And uh, you're going to see later some of the other events that uh, were prepared uh, to basically, again, be able to showcase also the local entrepreneurial talent when we basically host them you know, in different locations. Then we're going to hear uh, the, the presentation from four companies that we have selected. And last but not least, and as I know that you know, the people from the streaming, unfortunately, they cannot smell <laughs> the food that we're cooking up. But uh, I know that from the faces of some of you here that you could do smell. <laughs> uh, we're going to try some of the products of uh, uh, companies that we have selected uh, to be part of the, today's showcasing. And uh, of course, you know, the whole point of also the physical event that we, we do is to really help you guys to connect you know, with the local and the international ecosystem. So feel free to really, you know, swap uh, instead of maybe business cards, you know, WhatsApp numbers or, you know, as by, uh, of course, as you see fit. But the idea being that uh, we want to uh, maximize you, the opportunity, thanks for that, uh, the opportunity uh, of networking, you know, for you guys. So, um, but before I get to that, uh, let me introduce you to one of our partners, which is Talent Garden, which is the, the host of our Food Tech Innovation Hub, which we co-built you know, with them, and is also the host of today's event. So without further ado, let me pass it over to them. Thank you, and welcome to Talent Garden. For those of you who, okay, now you listen to me, okay. Uh, welcome, and for those of you who still don't know Talent Garden, we are here with, I'm here to just briefly introduce you to what we do. We started out in 2011 as a co-working space uh, in order to offer young 
professionals, um, entrepreneurs, and small businesses a place where to grow and flourish. Uh, a little bit over a decade later, we are still here. We have way more than just one space. We actually have 18 spread across Europe. We are in eight uh, countries, but uh, we are not only here as spaces. We are way more than that. We are a community, and over the years, we developed also a Talent Garden Innovation School, and thanks to that, and thanks to our belief that life learning uh, experiences actually can change how we provide and foster innovation. We also started collaborating with companies and in 2015 we actually also started collaborating with companies. As we're right now, just to sum it all up, we are a, com a community of over five, um, almost 5,000 people and we just wanted to welcome you to be part of those and as Alessio said, the smell is amazing, so I'm not going to take way more time, and welcome. Thank you very much, Maria Cristina. Uh, again, was just to kind of also help you get a bit more context you know, about where we are and uh, what we also do here, you know, besides running uh, this type of events. Uh, but before uh, I jump straight into uh, the Food Tech 500, which as I said, you know, is the sort of main course, you know, of today, uh, session. I wanted to give you a bit more uh, context about what we do as an organization as Forward Footing. Um, we launched the company in 2015 in uh, London and uh, we a very simple idea really which was uh, we saw a big opportunity uh, in the development that the agri-food tech space was offering and we wanted to really hyper connect you know all the different players that operate in this uh, ecosystem with a very you know simple belief that by helping them to know each other and to connect we can actually foster you know food innovation uh, through basically collaboration so effectively what we do is you really enable you know collaborations across all the different uh, ecosystem stakeholders uh, by hyper really connecting them uh, more practically the way we uh, work is uh, through three pillars really on the one end uh, we have assembled uh, the largest the world largest uh, agri-food tech database in the world, which now counts about 20,000 uh, ecosystem actors, uh, including you know, startup and scale-up companies, of course, but also accelerators, uh, institutional investors, corporate, corporate venture capital. And uh, to be honest with you, is really the tool that we use to make sense of what's going on out there. Like, there was so much, you know, there is so much still, you know, innovation that is happening. And, uh, in order for us to be able to make sense of it, we had to have basically a tool that you know, could help us navigate it. Um, but then on the other hand, uh, of course, we work with corporates and investors to really help them to understand you know, the global ecosystem and again, uh, provide that connectivity that I was alluding to earlier. Uh, and this is really how we then are capable of offering to startups and scale-up companies that we select to be part of our network or to be part of our innovation hubs in London and Barcelona now, um, to really help them free of charge, which uh, sounds a bit crazy, but <laughs> it's what we've been doing you know, for now almost eight years. And is really what we think can really help us to create the impact that we actually create. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a second, but uh, it was just, just to kind of give you, you know, a bit more information about how we operate also a, as an organization. And uh, just to uh, shed some light on uh, the numbers that I also alluded to earlier, uh, the current global agri-food tech ecosystem as we know it, uh, thanks to our internal uh, profiteering databases, uh, accounts for about for over 8500 companies globally that are innovating through technology you know from farm to fork and beyond uh, about 1700 uh, uh, institutional investors that are actively investing in this space. Our definition of that is uh, they need to have at least three to four investments in the again agri food tech space across the supply chain. Um, and then ultimately we have mapped about 400 now um, corporate and corporate venture capital. So they're again, are actively investing or creating partnerships with startups and scale-up companies. Uh, we're sharing these numbers because later I'm gonna try to give you a bit of a deep dive into uh, the history of the Foodtech 500 and how we use again data 
to understand what's going on you know out there and this 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 type of data points will help you uh understand better what, I, what I'm going to be talking about later. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier as well, we run now uh, two uh, food tech innovation hubs directly ourselves, one in London and one in Barcelona. And the, the, what we offer them is basically a shared co-working space, like uh, uh, Talent Garden, uh, but most and foremost, again, the knowledge and the network that we have developed over the, eight, over the past eight years. So the way we operate it is uh, we provide selected companies within our innovation hubs with an equity-free and fee-free program where we go and work on the challenges that the founders are trying to tackle, and we use our collective network to really try to help them, right? And the idea behind it is really that we think that there is no one size fits all when it comes to you know, supporting a company. And we need to basically spend that time to really dig deeper into you know, the understanding of the challenges they're trying to tackle to really move the needle for them. And so this is really what then you know, the companies that join our uh, hubs get in, in exchange. And, uh, uh, but as I said, you know, everything uh, uh, that we're going to be talking about today is, part of, is about the Food Tech 500, which uh, is a global, effectively, endeavor that we started uh, running uh, uh, back in 2019. I'll give you a bit of the genesis of that. Uh, we were having lunch with our team uh, in London, and uh, we were, uh, I think, beyond me to just uh, announce their IPO. And we were all wondering, you know, who's going to be next, right? And... Uh, Everybody had, you know, their own sort of uh, idea and speculations, you know, about it. But uh, the reality is that we didn't know. And, uh, and so we thought, why don't we create actually a listing where companies, you know, can apply and we develop a methodology to effectively uh, rank them to understand, you know, who are going to be the companies that are going to get, let's say, you know, to a place where they can think about IPOing, right? Uh, and so this is really how it started. It started as an idea and uh, uh, we, we put it off the ground, uh, again, ver being very inspired by the Fortune 500, which, which is a, a global listing that features, you know, uh, some of the largest, again, companies in the world. And we said, you know, the, the whole point about doing it should be to showcase what we call the underdogs, main, namely the companies that maybe don't have enough you know, uh, resources, uh, media attention to really be all over the media, right? And we can create a tool that can help you know, uh, people that are interested in this space to navigate you know, what is happening and how companies you know, are growing or you know, uh, <laughs> decreasing their growth if necessary. And, uh, and so this is really how it started. And, but the idea has always been, you know, kind of get putting the spotlight on uh, the companies that are creating very meaningful innovation for the food system, but again, might not be as big as others to be you know, all over the, the media and therefore you know, be known by also consumers. And with this very simple you know, idea in mind, um, over again the last four years now, we were able to generate quite a bit of impact. Uh, these are some of the stats that uh, we have uh, put you know, together. Just to give you an idea of over the course of the last four years, uh, we received about 7,500 applications from international companies, again, innovating from farm to fork. Uh, we were able to provide them basically exposure. And this is really what was the ultimate goal of the Food Tech 500, you know, provide them with exposure within our international uh, community. Uh, to be able to, again, spot, shine the spotlight on the innovators, right? And this is why I'm so excited, you know, to also unveil in a second uh, who's, who, who made it, you know, into this year's list, because every, every year changes. And uh, we have started to come to the, to, to the realization that is, is really becoming a proxy of what is happening in the global ecosystem, right? And again, I don't want to create more suspense about that, but you'll get to see it, you know, in a second. And um, uh, the way we developed the methodology behind it as we started out uh, was very simple. On the one end, uh, we basically look at the business size and uh, the digital footprint of these companies, the, the, the applicants, let's call it. And we actually use an algorithm within our data intelligence platform that allows us to create uh, this, this scoring mechanism. So 
what you look at, what we're looking at right now is uh, the business size core is effectively a proxy of the amount of capital that these companies have, have managed to raise and the amount of markets within they operate, namely the number of offices that they actually establish in different geographies. Uh, the digital footprint is a proxy of uh, the amount of traffic that they're able to generate over uh, their website and how fast they're growing over social media. Um, while the uh, sustainability score, which we thought from the very beginning needed to be part of our scoring mechanism, is, was actually developed in collaboration with uh, um, experts from the academia world in absence of a framework that we could you know, use uh, throughout uh, basically the companies that operate uh, within the supply chain. And uh, it's basically based on a self, uh, self-served you know, survey that companies effectively share with us and is all ingrained into the SDGs, so the Sustainable Development Goals that the UN have established. But again, uh, I can tell you that is a, is a pretty big endeavor. Uh, not only scrutinizing uh, 7,500 companies over the past you know, four years, but most and foremost, you know, really reaching these companies as well as uh, ranking them, you know. So we wouldn't be able to do it without all the support of our media partners, of our sponsors, as well as our technical partners. And so um, before I get into, well, and there are many other people, including our team, that of course, you know, work relentlessly to really uh, uh, make this, uh, this, this Putte 500, you know, happen. But before I get into that, I wanted to also, uh, again, uh, share with you that w the way we operate as an organization is really uh, by embracing collaboration and this is the reason why we also you know stress the fact that you know by enabling these connections we can really help other organizations also to become more collaborative if you will but the reason why we put it on a slide on his own is really to help you understand that again it's kind of like our secret sauce is uh, leveraging collaborations and making it our competitive advantage in the long haul. So, uh, before I get into, you know, thanking everyone, first and foremost, I want to thank also one of our sponsors that uh, has been uh, supporting us now for the past three years, as far as the FoodTech 500 is concerned. Uh, they're called Neom, and uh, they are a, a very ambitious project that is happening actually in the, um, in the MENA region, or G GCC, uh, close to Riyadh. They're building this uh, uh, pretty incredible, to be honest with you, city. Uh, and they've been investing uh, in understanding really what the future of food is going to look like because they want to embed some of these technologies within our uh, in, within their city so uh, they are into in you know the making process of building actually this uh, it's called the line so is a is a city that you know will be effectively developed you know, horizontally uh, and um, uh, unfortunately they couldn't make it to this event to share actually what they do but they did send us a video uh, that hopefully will give you a little bit of a glimpse into what they're working on as far as food tech is concerned <laughs> Traditional methods of food production aren't enough to meet the challenges of overpopulation and climate change. But there is still hope. By sowing the seeds of innovation, Neom is aiming to reshape the way we feed the world while having a positive impact on the environment. Regenerative breakthrough farming methods and versatile growing solutions will feed this change. Harnessing green energy to power a circular economy, advances in biotechnology and next generation aquaculture will fast track productivity and improve efficiency while preserving the sea ecosystem and the integration of novel foods legacy free regulations and personalized nutrition will make it easier for people to make informed responsible food choices this is how we will change the future of food and nourish people and planet neom made to change so this was just to kind of give you also a bit of a of a perspective into uh, you know what also other organizations across the world you know are working on when it comes to really planning what 
their how they can leverage technology to also be you know less dependent uh, on you know uh, the existing uh, sort of food system uh, the city as i mentioned you know is established close to riyadh so in a place where there isn't really a lot of land you know where they can actually uh, grow food and that's why again technology is one of the enablers of you know reducing that uh, uh, dependency really but as i mentioned earlier um after you know four years into uh, the making of this listing, uh, we tried to basically create uh, uh, data modeling to understand how we could reflect you know on the FUTE 500 as a sort of a proxy of what is going on you know in the global agri food tech ecosystem. And again, thanks to our platform, as I mentioned earlier, what you're looking basically here uh, on this slide is. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see that the deviation in terms of composition of, the, of this year's Food Tech 500 compared to the global agri food tech ecosystem, those 8,500 companies that I alluded to earlier, uh, is very little. So again, uh, it, it's kind of like equally distributed across eight different micro categories that goes from uh, Ag tech all the way through consumer apps and services, and the food tech 500 this year uh, effectively reflects really well. You know, again, uh, the composition of the global agri food tech uh, agri food tech landscape, but not only in terms of you know where the companies you know that operate within the ecosystem you know position themselves, but it's also in terms of funding. What you're looking at here is on the the yellow basically line is the amount of funding that was raised by 8,500 companies you know, over the last uh, uh, 10 years. And uh, this is where do you, see the, you can see the distribution of, uh, the, of this year's Food Tech 500. Again, it reflects uh, very well the, the, the trend, the investment trends that the rest of uh, the ecosystem basically uh, has been observed. And uh, uh, the other, uh, we're a bit of a data freaks, so <laughs> when it comes to then, you know, trying to figure out um, what are the sort of markers, you know, of, uh, of again, the, the composition of 500 companies that made it into this year's listing? Um, we, have also, we, we were very uh, pleased to know that uh, there's been an increase of threefold in terms of uh, number of companies that have obtained their B Corp certification or are in the process of, of obtaining it. Um, 80% is the average, average uh, number of companies that tackle climate, uh, the, the SDG related to climate, so the number 13, which again, it also proves and is a testament of the fact that uh, food tech is a big actually driver of the climate tech you know, space. Uh, and last but not least, uh, which is also another uh, very interesting data point that we always look at is the composition of the founding team of some of the companies that make it into our uh, Food Tech 500. And uh, I'm very pleased to say that this year, 20% uh, is the number of companies within our Food Tech 500 that are actually led by minority groups. This includes uh, anything from Ben all the way through LGBT plus and uh, people with disability. And uh, this year was the whole time high with uh, more than 100 companies basically out of the 500 that are actually led by uh, minority groups. But again, I don't want to make this you know, too, <laughs> too long. Uh, we're here to basically share who made it this year into the Food Tech uh, 500, the 2022 edition. These are some of the key impact metrics. With this year, we've received about 2,100 actually applications from 67 countries. And again, thanks to our Food Tech Data Navigator, we were able to also extrapolate what that means in terms of the patents that have been filed by uh, these 2,100 companies and how many jobs have been created to date. This is a proxy of the number of headcounts that these companies have. So as you can see, they're pretty you know, staggering uh, uh, stats. And uh, I just wanted to also pinpoint here that uh, we basically have received this year uh, 2,100 applications from companies that uh, then, uh, you know, we selected the 500 and 100% of them actually received funding. And uh, I can tell you that in 2019, when we actually started, 
it was closer to 70%, right? And so again, it shows is a testament of the fact that we're raising the bar always a bit higher, but also again, uh, the hundred dogs are also catching up, if you will, and really uh, becoming part of a movement of companies that are creating real impact, right? 70% um, of them are revenue generating as of the time when they applied. Uh, there are seven publicly traded companies, so companies that have IPO'd, and, uh, and, then, and another eight companies that are worth at least a billion uh, dollars at the time when they applied. And as a cluster of 500, they have raised to date about $10.7 billion. Um, but again, what I also want to focus on, uh, and as you can see, you know, it's uh, all, all sort of uh, um, stages of development, so from pre-seed all the way to Series C+, uh, and all sort of sizes, right? From zero to five uh, uh, employees, all the way through, you know, companies that also have 200, uh, between 200 and 500, you know, uh, employees. But again, I just want to stress the fact that uh, the founding team composition is uh, a, a key, um, indicator for us to really understand you know also how diverse these cluster of companies you know are in terms of again uh, composition of their founding team and again i'm, I'm also uh, very pleased to share that also this year more than 50 percent of uh, the companies that made it into this this year uh, listing are basically part of they're either you uh, women led or part of minority groups which again it, it i think is a testament of the fact that is not only a space that can really create a big impact for the humankind, but is also very diverse compared to, I think, you know, other, let's say, verticals like uh, fintech maybe or, uh, or, or other ones. But again, uh, I know that the suspense is growing and uh, uh, the smell of the food also <laughs> is, uh, is keeping you distracted from, from this. So without further ado, let me share uh, this year's uh, Food Tech 500 uh, top 10. Um, it's very interesting to see that compared to other the, the former, you know, editions of it, uh, uh, there are new companies, you know, that are also coming into play. Um, it's been an historically uh, a listing that. Uh, was pretty, uh, let's say, heavy on uh, also ag tech because the vertical farming company um, were basically, were kept on applying. But I'm very pleased to share that also this year we had, uh, uh, we, we start seeing, you know, also new alternative protein companies really starting to make it into the, the top 10, which uh, again, I think is a very interesting uh, uh, finding of, again, what's in the global agri-food tech ecosystem and what is hot, so to speak, you know, right now. Uh, again, key impact metrics about uh, uh, this cluster, uh, very quickly, 4 billion, uh, roughly speaking, uh, raised up to date, about 3,200 uh, uh, jobs created as a cluster of 10 companies, 300 uh, patents filed and 4, 48 markets served. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, although for the sake of the presentation, you know, we just keep now the top 10 uh, and we showcase, you know, who they are. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the whole mission of the Fit 500 is really to showcase the underdog. So I very much uh, recommend that you go and scan this uh, QR code or go on uh, forwardfooting.com uh, slash foodtech500 to basically access the full list of 500 businesses that we have selected this year. And with that, uh, we're also going to share that uh, we have created this year a white paper, as we do every year, where we have the full list of companies available uh, to download, but also where we dig deeper into the data behind uh, the Fukte 500, and we provide additional insight about, you know, again, the composition of the uh, founding team, as well as, you know, how they are doing from a sustainability perspective. So very much recommended you also download that. And uh, we're basically, uh, to kick off you know, this, uh, this session, we decided to ask actually some of the folks who, who have been uh, listed you know, in the former edition to share what they do, uh, what is their, their mission as a company, and what actually the Foot 500 means for them. So without further ado, I'm going to almost virtually you know, have them in this room through the, this video that tells you a bit more about uh, what some of, the, some of our alumni basically do and also uh, how they think about you know, the Food Tech 500.
Hi, I'm Thomas Jonas, CEO and co-founder of Nature's Fine. I'm Mark Oshima, co-founder and chief marketing officer for AeroFarm. My name is Erez Galonska. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Infound. Hi, I'm Antoine Hubert, CEO and co-founder of Insect. I'm Keely Wax. Senior Vice President of Marketing for Produce Bay. Hi, I'm Matt Crisp, CEO and co-founder of Benson Hill. My name is Case Arts, and I'm the CEO and founder of Produce. Our mission is to grow the best plants possible for the betterment of humanity. We are building a network of climate-resilient farms around the world that are located closer to communities to provide fresh, pesticide-free, nutritious produce to everyone everywhere. The mission of Insect is to reinvent the food chains. That means providing new ingredients made of insects to feed sustainably in a healthy manner plants, animals and humans. Produce Pay's mission is to create a more sustainable and connected global fresh produce supply chain. We're a food tech company that's unlocking the natural genetic potential of plants and creating food ingredients that are made better from the beginning. At Protex, we create insect-based protein and nutrition from a range of waste streams. We grow five here in Chicago. We harvested more than 40 million plants to date and saved more than 150 million liters of water, over 200,000 square meters of land, and nearly 1.6 million of food miles. That's equivalent to five round trips to the moon. The impact of our solutions at Insect are numerous. In food and pet food, our ingredients emit up to 40 times less carbon emissions than conventional meats. In fish feed, for each ton of our product, is up to 5 tons of wild fish which are not caught from the oceans. And in our fertilizer, feeding the plants are carbon sinks compared to uh, chemical fertilizers. We estimate that there's nearly 50% of economic and food waste throughout the global fresh produce supply chain. We wake up every day trying to address that challenge. Benson Hill soy can require up to 90% less water and up to 97% less CO2 to produce compared to Brazilian sourced soy protein concentrate. We also have a variety with low anti-nutrients that goes into high protein soy meal for aquaculture, relieving pressure on ocean ecosystems. We can help reduce the footprint of food and feed by more than 70% in terms of land, water and CO2. We are thrilled to be part of the 2022 Food Tech 500 and feel incredibly honored to be sitting alongside the most groundbreaking innovative companies out there. We are very proud to be part of Food Tech 500 because it shows technology can help to increase food sovereignty and reduce climate change. We are truly honored to be part of the Food Tech 500. We are very proud to be part of the 2023 Food Tech 500, which is a huge compliment to all the hard work and effort that the Protex team has put in and helped where we stand today. I'm really excited to be among the top 10 of the 2022 Food Tech 500. It's an honor to be a part of the Food Tech 500, especially as Benson Hill grows internationally. We just opened our office in Barcelona this past year. So, uh, I just wanted to show you this very brief video to kind of have, you know, these people that really work hard every day. And again, I just said that they are indicative of the, this year's listing and, and, and all the other editions. But by all means, you know, uh, we think that there is also so much more. But we thought that it was a really good way to kind of get them, you know, virtually in the room with us as they couldn't really fly out you know <laughs> all of them here uh, it was also to give you a bit of an understanding of uh, a better understanding of the breadth of the innovation that some of these companies you know are developing literally from you know uh, ag tech all the way to through retail tech uh, and you know to alternative protein and um, as, as you know as, as, an, as an example so it was kind of to give you an idea of the the impact and the sort of um, uh, encompassing, you know, area that we cover as the Food Tech 500. But I forgot to mention at the very beginning that uh, uh, we have more surprises for you. So I'm really excited to share one that we've been working on uh, over the past, uh, well, year or so. Uh, one of the things that we've noticed 
effectively over the years is that uh, in order to really stay through to our mission of showcasing the underdogs, um, we really had to make a, a call. And uh, we did make a call, which I'm going to comment right after showing you a little brief, brief video that is going to help you understand why we did it. Some of you might have noticed, uh, either in the room or uh, connecting uh, digitally today, uh, on this year's list, you're going to find a little uh, C-shaped mark that effectively is going to is going to move on. Yes, is <laughs> um, going to help you to understand who are the companies that have raised to date over a hundred million dollars. The reason being that again, we don't want just to celebrate the ones that are capable of you know, creating success through their fundraising activities, but is to really help contextualize you know, what you're looking at, right? And so we decided to create this, uh, this club, which we call the, the Futek 100 Million Club, uh, to really be able to kind of showcase the outliers you know, of this industry to date, uh, just to give you a bit more um, context. There are about 300, over 320 companies within our data intelligence platform that have raised more than $100 million, and they can go you know, from $100 uh, million to billions, right? And uh, this is where we started noticing you know, this year. So this is why we created it. To be able to, again, stay through to our mission, we had to make that cut. And uh, we, by churning, churning a quite a lot of data, we figured that 100 million was really the right sort of uh, threshold, uh, below which you know, we can talk about the underdogs and above which we can talk about outliers, right? And so here, we just put together some of the key metrics. Uh, again, as uh, this year, there were 23 members, as we call it, that made it into this, uh, this uh, club, which is part of the Foodtech 500. And the, uh, as a collective, they raised $6.6 billion you know, dollars to date. And most of them are basically over or in between a series C or C plus, you know, in, in terms of raising, you know, the different stages of, uh, of investment rounds. Um, their key activity or the most recurring activity is AgTech. And as a cluster, again, they effectively uh, compound for 62% of the funding uh, of the total, you know, um, uh, 500 companies that have made it into this list. So again, it's a significant amount which made us effectively decide to to make, you know, this new sort of club that showcase the ones that are in today's outlier, effectively. And without further ado, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, this is the C-shaped uh, logo that you will find on this year's listing. And from there, you can you get redirected to their full page. But again, it's to kind of help you understand uh, what you're looking at. Dear. Yeah, and so by scanning this code, you can also access, uh, again, uh, this year's listing as well as apply for next year's edition. So for all the entrepreneurs that are uh, you know, in the room and uh, connecting, you know, digitally, uh, I very much recommend, you know, that you, no matter of your stage of development, no matter where you are in your journey, is to really uh, apply to be able to be part of uh, the ones that effectively get free visibility uh, within our international community. 
And uh, before passing it uh, over to our international uh, guest today, I just wanted to remind you that, as I mentioned earlier, this is the first event that we're going to run, in, and uh, this is the unveiling, the official unveiling of the 2022 uh, Fotec 500. But we're taking it on a tour, so next uh, we're uh, going to London in our Fotec Innovation Hub to basically, again, give more visibility to local companies. Uh, we were, were followed by Berlin and Stockholm, where again, in collaboration with other leading organizations that, that work in the same space, we're going to be running more events to showcase the local heroes, as we call them. And uh, without further ado, I just wanted to introduce you to uh, our guest speaker today, uh, who is uh, Celine, uh, coming from e EDB. EDB is one of the uh, of our actually uh, sponsor uh, for the Futech 500 events uh, series. And uh, he flew directly from Paris. However, he is actually from Singapore. And he's going to tell you a bit more about uh, what they do at the Economic Development Board of Singapore and give you a bit of a, I think, uh, a journey or share a bit of their journey into the world of food tech and hopefully uh, tell you a bit more about, you know, uh, the type of technology that they, they invest in there. Celine, without further ado, please uh, uh, welcome to our stage. All right. Before I start, always good to wake up the audience with a bit of a video. <laughs> so I'm just going to stand at the side and let the video play. You have so many people that don't have access to food at all. On the other hand, you have people consuming too much of the wrong food. For us to be able to feed the world, we need technology that can revolutionize the way we farm. We can start with a single cell. And from a single cell, you can make billions of pounds of meat. We not only can have a higher yield and higher nutrients with the same amount of input, but at the same time, we can provide fresh and tasty greens all year round. As the world population increases, the technology like Equal is able to feed the world with healthy, sustainable fish and yet do not pollute the environment. It's about food that doesn't require the slaughter of a single animal, doesn't require knocking down trees. What we eat impacts everything else. There are over 190 countries in the world, and only one country has decided to be the leader. It was one of the most historic forward-thinking moves in the history of the food system. The farm that we're building here in Singapore will really be a model for the future farms. And so my biggest hope for the future of food is that together we can create new technologies to achieving food security for everyone. And this begins right here in Singapore. All right, if you think Alex speaks fast, right, you haven't spoken to a Singaporean yet because when we get excited or we drink a bit of the wine, we speak even faster than this. So I'm going to slow down a little bit. A very good evening, everyone. My name is Zilin, and I'm actually very excited to be in Barcelona. Why? Because it's actually as much sun as where I come from, this little island called Singapore. Show of hands, who has actually been to Singapore? Wow, okay, maybe I should step out of the room now since most of you have been, <laughs> no point presenting. But jokes aside, for those who do not know us, right, Singapore is in the middle of a 650 million population, lots of mouths to feed. And this small, sunny and very green, with a lot of plants, um, um, island is often affectionately called the Little Red Dot. So this Little Red Dot, right, it's an important east-west trading point in the past, and it's a melting pot of cultures, opportunities and cuisines. But since this is clearly a food conference, right, what I'm going to do is going to talk about Singapore and our very weird relationship with food. You guys know ChatGPT, right? So before the conference, I decided to play with ChatGPT because I'm a, I actually have a master in chemical engineering and I'm a bit nerdy and geeky that way. So we asked ChatGPT, tell me about Singapore. Tell me something funny about Singapore. And it came out with a lot of funny things you can't read here. But the key point is that one phrase caught my eye. Singaporeans are obsessed with food. And I mean it. There are two national 
pastimes or hobbies in Singapore. Number one is queuing up for food. The second one is eating food, right? So I think even the AI agrees with me about Singapore's obsession with food. If you've eaten in Singapore before, there is this thing called a hawker centre, a food centre, and the way of eating there, the street food culture, has actually been recognised by UNESCO as a cultural heritage. So before I dive further into Singapore's obsession with food and innovation, let me share a bit more about my organisation, EDB. In a nutshell, what is EDB? We are the architects and designers of Singapore's economy. We actually founded four years before Singapore became independent in 1965. So as a government agency, what do we do? We determine Singapore's economic strategy, we develop new industries, we support global companies that do manufacturing, headquarters, innovation activities in Singapore. We also help companies to build new ventures. And I'll share some examples there. We also have a VC fund that invests in startups, later stage, typically from Series B onwards. So if you're your Series B or you're coming to that stage, keep in touch with us. We always love to you know, talk to you. And some of the companies in the top 500 in the list uh, were actually invested by EDP ourselves. So we are fully funded government agency, so we don't charge any consultancy fees as well. So don't hesitate to talk to us. I guess there's such a thing as a free lunch. So raise of hands, who has actually heard about Singapore's 30 by 30 goal? Wow, there's actually people all the way here who have heard about that. So um, somebody said something. Sorry, sir, this has nothing to do with my waistline, all right? It's something more important than that. And on a more serious note, I wanted to give you a few numbers to talk about Singapore, give you more flavor to what Singapore is about. Um, if you look at Singapore's land size, Spain is almost 700 times larger than Singapore. And that's how compact and dense Singapore is. Our island state is actually very urbanized, yet dense with vegetation and flora. So there just isn't much space for us to grow you know, uh, food the traditional way. But we have an ambitious goal. And that is about whether Singapore can actually produce 30% of our food by 2030. And that explains what 30 by 30 is about. How do we use technology to help our farms in Singapore grow more with less. And how exactly is Singapore going to transform our agri-food industry into one that is highly productive and employs climate resistant, uh, resource efficient and sustainable technologies? Let me give you a few examples here on priorities that we're looking at. First of all, since 2017, land has been leased into two districts on the northern edge of the city uh, to large-scale commercial farm projects. It's called Lim Chu Kang and the other one is called Sengai Tengah. It's actually a word in Malay and Chinese. Um, we haven't stopped there. You can actually find food growing on car park rooftops, on reused outdoor spaces, retrofitted building interiors, and even viaducts. What you see in the middle of the picture here is Neta Tech, which is actually a vertical farm attached to the side of a residential building. It is a zero net energy farm that uses harvested rainwater and micro, micro, micro drop technology to grow leafy vegetables. What about aquaculture on your left side? There are about 100 sea-based farms in Little Singapore, and our aqu aquaculture focuses on higher-priced fish, such as barramundi, which is also known as the Asian sea bass, as well as shrimp. There are also a handful of land-based farms that grow higher-priced fish, such as tilapia. The aquaculture sector in Singapore is becoming quite sophisticated. You can actually find floating containers uh, in the middle of the sea, actually. They are developing, growing um, freshwater fish, and this system's incorporated tech to become highly automated or purpose-built floating structures. I will talk a bit more about Aqua Easy later, this AI platform for stream farming, in my slides in a short while. And because 30 by 30 is such an important priority for us, I want to talk a bit more about alternative proteins. So as you saw from the video, we are actually the first country in the world to approve cultured meats to be sold to consumers. And this vibrant food culture actually results in a lot of recipes and formats for new products. An example I can give you, Impossible Feet, Impossible Food, they typically sell their plant-based beef in the form of you know, hamburger patties, right? But in Singapore, to enter the Asian market, they provided their plant-based beef in the form of Vietnamese spring rolls, Chinese pancakes, and Japanese gyozas. And then these are doing a lot better in Asia than the typical ham uh, ham the, uh, hamburger-style patties. And right now, you can find impossible foods in more than 550 restaurants across Singapore. So let me give some examples of how our 30 by 30 every food journey is coming along. You can see right here, all the way over the last few years, we have almost one 
uh, almost a new agri-food plant or innovation center announced every few months. These, this is the level of activities happening in Singapore over just the last two or three years. We've seen agri-food startups innovate, traditional corporates who are not in the food space enter the agri-food space, and we even find new investors who have dedicated teams who are helping startups to you know, raise funds and also serve their needs. So what's Singapore's recipe actually for sustainable, healthy, and tasty food innovation? There are three ingredients. Number one, supporting innovation to flourish. Number two, making the supply chain a bit smoother. Number three, creating an enabling uh, environment for new products not just in Singapore, but also from Singapore to the rest of Asia and globally. Let me talk a bit more about ingredient one, all right, since we're so focused on food today. Number one, beyond the base of research institutes and clusters, Singapore has invested about 200 million euros in funding the Singapore Food Story R&D program. Where is this money going to, right? It's going to key agri-food areas such as sustainable urban food production and advanced biotech-based proteins. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because if you are a startup, keep a lookout for grant calls from Singapore from this fund because actually they provide you funding and access to new networks and business and innovation partners in Singapore. You might not know, but Singapore is actually home to all five all five of the world's largest flavors and fragrances companies from around the world. All five of them are in Singapore. The FMCG giants Unilever and PNG had the Asia Pacific headquarters and innovation teams in Singapore. Let me give you an example of Givaudan and uh, Buller. These two joined forces to open a protein innovation center in Singapore. Why so? Because Buller actually has capabilities in extrusion and processing equipment. However, Givaudan, on the other hand, their capabilities and culinary facilities in flavor, taste, ingredient, and product development. So when these two companies come together, they can develop new protein and products for the Asian market. And you must be asking again, why am I sharing all these examples? Why should I care as an agri-food startup? Well, very simple. All these corporates actually work very closely with EDB to actually do innovation calls. So we publish them on a couple of websites I can share with you later if you connect with me on LinkedIn. And these websites actually provide open innovation calls and startups can apply for them, understand what all these corporates are worried about, what keeps them awake at night, get some funding, get some investments and probably get a business deal through some of these open innovation challenges that are happening from Singapore and globally. I want to talk about a main problem that a lot of agri-food companies tell me. First of all, I want to do pilot food production. I want to do R&D, you know, for food. But as an agri-food startup, it costs a lot of infrastructure. It's not a cheap thing to do, to invest in so much capital. So to speed up the food innovation from your lab to your table, actually Singapore has invested in a lot of shared facilities to help food companies de-risk and lower the risk of pilot production. So let me give you an example of uh, authority proteins, right? Where the Food Tech Innovation Center, established by the Singapore investment company, Tamasic, and ASTAR, provides ready-built shared innovation equipment and space to support pilot scale extrusion and fermentation. So you don't have to build it yourself. We also have private, con private sector contract manufacturers and service providers, light Escoester and SG Protein that helps you to do pilot and commercial uh, production for your food products. In the coming months, if you are coming to Singapore, we're going to launch an 18 hectare agri food and innovation park. What can you find in this park? You will find insect feed companies, you will find indoor plant factories, and you'll find enemy feed animal feed production facilities. So the last ingredient, of course, is not just about Singapore, right? Because Singapore is a small market, as you've guessed. It's 700 times smaller than Spain, right? Why are companies in Singapore? It's because Singapore is surrounded by 650 million mouths to feed. And you can see from here that actually, while China is the largest food market, India and Southeast Asia is actually where the increase will be the fastest in the coming years, coming decade. In terms of numbers, food spending in Asia is expected to double between now and 2030, reaching 8 trillion US dollars. So why use Singapore? Well, the, the brand for Singapore, the made in Singapore brand, allows you to actually export your products to the rest of Asia, and they tend to be recognized highly for their food safety and quality standards. You might not know, but one out of four people living in Singapore 
are not actually born in Singapore. They are actually talent from around the world. And most Singaporeans speak English and one or two additional Asian or Western languages. So for example, I speak English, French, Mandarin, two Chinese dialects. I'm also learning Arabic. And I'm not the only Singaporean like that. A lot of us speak more than two or three languages. And I hope that you can find a Singaporean that can help you bring some of your products to the rest of the market. And the diverse food scene in Singapore, from fine dining to food, allows you to test some of it, like a living lab, and test bit some of these solutions for the market. My last point here is about free trade agreement. So you can innovate all you want, and every year you can drop your cost by 5%, by 10%, by 15%. But if you're exporting from the wrong country into your key market, like US, China, or Europe, what's going to happen is that you might be slapped on a 10, 15, 20, or 30% trade tariff on your product. So whatever savings you develop, all this, are actually useless. So not many people know, but Singapore has 25 free trade agreements with key markets like Europe, US, China, India, Australia, Latin America, and all of the Southeast Asian countries. So they have to reduce all of the all or some of the barriers to your products that you're selling from Singapore. So let's end off with two case studies. I've spoke a lot about the three ingredients. Let me give you an example of a story of an EJAS who actually in 2020 received the first in the world regulatory approval for sale of cell culture meats to consumers. They've grown a lot through their partner in Singapore, Esco Esther, and they just, just a few months ago, few, sorry, a few weeks ago, they secured another regulatory approval in Singapore for the first serum-free media that can be sold to customers as well. So wait for some of their products, they will come to a table near you. The second example I want to give you would be an example from Germany. So why am I sharing this example? This company is called Bosch, right? You might have heard about them. Bosch is a German, very famous engineering company known for their sensors, their robotics, their automation systems. But what happened is that this company actually used Singapore's innovation ecosystem to enter the food scene. They are now playing in the aquaculture business. So you know the stream industry typically is known for very high mortality rates. So AquaEasy combines AI, data analytics, sensors and software to actually create an integrated solution to help farmers improve their yield. Through Singapore and EDB support, they found customers in Indonesia, in Vietnam, as well as in Singapore. Many stream farms across the area. So a real story of a corporate who's not at all in food entering the aquaculture uh, ecosystem from Singapore, not just for Asia, but globally. After all these pictures, I hope that you guys are starting to feel hungry. <laughs> I am uh, going to share some ideas on how you can be part of the Singapore ecosystem. And I'll be hanging around because the food is so good, smells so good as well. Thank you, Alex. So I will be hanging around. Ask me some questions. If you are a startup and you are post Series A and later, there is a Future Food Asia um, Awards which is open to all startups that are not from Asia as well. The winners will get support from ID Capital to expand into uh, Asia. Later in this year, Singapore will also host again the Singapore International Agri-Food Week. So perhaps consider a business trip down to find your first customer, innovation partner, first investor, or maybe even you know, try some of the Singaporean food. CDB is also launching one of our free guides, the 2023 edition of the Agri-Food Tech Guide for Singapore. So register and you can get a copy, and hopefully that will help you access more opportunities in the region. So I think I'm going to end off my talk here by saying what exactly is the secret sauce? It's a bit corny, but Singapore can invest in all the infrastructure and all the networks that we want. But what really matters is whether we are open-minded to work with basically the agri-tech innovators like yourselves. You guys are actually the secret sauce. All of our partners are not necessarily from Singapore nor Asia. They are from all around the world. And what matters to us is to remain open-minded and know that the best ideas, the best solutions, the best technologies don't necessarily come from, from, from Asia. They come from around the world. So what we want to do is, if you're curious about Singapore's food ecosystem and partnership opportunities, connect with us. Connect with me over LinkedIn. You know, talk to me later. I'll be hanging around. I can give you some ideas of how you could find your first partner in Asia and maybe give you some suggestions on what other sectors that might be more interesting to you. Once again, thank you so much, Alex, for the opportunity. And I hope um, to see you guys in Singapore. One last word. There's this word called M-A-K-N makan. It means to eat in Malay or Singapore English, Singlish. So I hope to see you guys for a makan session in Singapore very time soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Celine. Uh,
uh, I, could, I guess you couldn't make it you know, any better in uh, trying to take uh, all the room and the people on the streaming uh, on a sort of a virtual journey on you know, what Singapore is all about uh, and, and also what can offer you know, to agri-food tech entrepreneurs. So thank you very much for sharing that. Uh, we're moving on really quickly, actually, from Singapore to Spain, where we are actually uh, live streaming today, uh, to actually showcase some of the top-ranked companies based in Spain. They made it into this year's uh, listing. So without further ado, uh, these are the companies that we selected for you today. Um, we're going to go again on a journey from... Uh, um, retail tech, or let's call it uh, marketplaces, all the way through Turnity Protein and well beyond. Uh, but without further ado, let me introduce you your first uh, company's presentations for today, which is uh, Benoit from uh, uh, Consentio. Thank you. Great to see you. And I confirm I've been to Singapore. I've been an event speaker in Singapore. And, uh, I congratulate you because it's a very open society and uh, very stimulating. And I remember the food courts in Asia and in Singapore in Pakua, you, you eat very well. So congrats. So I confirm. Um, so um, I will, uh, so I'm the co-founder of Consensio. I worked in, uh, in, uh, in, um, in technology and B2C technology. And, uh, well, nowadays, most of you are used to, to have a very easy life. We have Netflix, we have Apple, we have Amazon. And what we see when you look at uh, technology in the food supply chain, you don't have the feeling, and if you really do what's commonly called uh, shadowing, if you really go in Mercabarna here, Rangis in Paris, or, and if you go uh, sit with someone in charge of buying 50 trucks of tomatoes at the supermarket headquarters, you actually see that their lives is like 20, 30 years backwards. And you could say, I don't care, but um, right now I, I had a neighbor who's from UK, and uh, in UK uh, they don't have food. <laughs> you can check with him. I'm sure it's in the news. And we've seen also with several events, geopolitical events, in the past two, three years, uh, it has made the food supply chain a bit at the center. So, and if you, Beyond the convenience, if you don't use technology, you have disruption of supply chain, right? And Consensio, uh, with a team, with uh, my co-founder and all the team we have, we, we said, let's bring all our know-how and all the experience of B2C and what it can bring to the B2B, right? Um, so, I think... Uh, what we were saying about uh, food, and we are used that uh, when we have dinner, lunch, it's a community event around food, it's a restaurant. But also, let's not forget that pro the whole ecosystem historically in our lives of eating, of choosing what we're going to eat, of producing it, is a community thing. And too long, um, food has been treated like a commodity, and what I remember, because I lived in Asia in addition to visiting Singapore, is from the Asians, very early on, I, I learned, you are what you eat. And I think now we realize in Europe, and you have much more vegetarians in Singapore or in India, where I lived, and as a Westerner, 20 years ago, when I would go there, I was like, oh, people can really never eat meat, and they are alive, right? <laughs> and now it's obvious, we are doing all these impossible foods, but uh, it was quite, Asia was quite ahead on that, right? And this is very important, and we believe that um, not only the rational facts about food are important, it's the emotional fact, the story behind the food, and what we want to create is a more win-win approach between supermarkets, consumers, and the producers. That we, we go back to the roots and understanding why it's important for the planet, why it's important for our health, so that we don't have price war and we can think in relationship. And what was interesting talking about UK supermarkets, uh, I was being told that one of the mistakes, they were not working enough the relationship. So if you have too much of a com pure commercial relationship, you, when the price is not right, then you don't have food. And it's not viable 
in the long run. So, for example, what we've done in France, so we are present in France, Netherlands, Spain, uh, United States, not yet Singapore. Uh, but we try to foster this at our scale, and we think we are just at the beginning of a journey. And we welcome everyone who wants to say, look, I know a lot of supermarkets in Spain or in Singapore, and let's do the same. So people who work in, in supermarkets and who are managing the fresh and we are focused on fruit and vegetables are quite proud of what they do. And so we help them to show it, and we help them to show it to the producers. So we do on our platform, which has community features in addition to the what you can do, uh, but at a, you can order 50 trucks of tomatoes on Consensio with your existing relationship. But we also want to show, and w so we run uh, in France for now, but we want to run it in more countries. Um, and with this is a Spanish company, for example, with very large cooperatives and producers. And you see all, the, all, those, all those stores have participated. Um, a competition was the best looking uh, fresh store was the more sustainable, was the most local. And this is part of our willingness to create this long-term momentum where, yes, you might not see supermarkets as a place to go uh, for fun and emotions, but it can be. And probably the most emotional part of a supermarket and where you have living is the fresh food. And so I'm going to show you a bit uh, some of the deco, right? Uh, there are many more, like yeah, you have a lot of French flags, you have the reproduce the farm. And if you go to Consensio, we have a public channel, you can discover this competition if you register from France. And so we had more than 300 supermarkets who participated, who competed, and we had more than 1.6 million views on that. And uh, a bit like uh, forward footing, we believe communication is very important. Uh, to change the mindset, right? And to help also understand supermarkets that they will bring consumers to a different mindset that also can be very positive. And sometimes, just to give you an example, yeah, is sometimes say, oh, you help people, supermarkets to buy the cheapest. No, it's not necessarily how you make the best business by buying the cheapest. It's where you have a good experience, creation of value, then you can have better margin. So. Here are a few things we automate, we improve, because you are, what I was saying earlier, you have PDF, Excel, um, uh, it's really uh, backward. So one, some of those features are more dead today. We, we automate and we bring a bit what you already have in your life. And so you can have supermarkets who receive uh, catalogs by fax, by paper, by uh, Excel files, and can be some supermarkets receive hundreds or thousands of Excel files as catalogs. So we make it what for you is obvious as consumers, we make it available for someone in charge of buying every day. Uh, and because you have less mistakes, because you automate, because you have community, you have overall a better experience. And you can have the top talent in the supermarket because suddenly instead of doing administrative tasks, they can have a relationship with the producers, they can have feedback from the consumers, uh, and they, they feel we all are part of the food committee today, so they p feel part of a story and purpose it, for people working in supermarket, for producers, is very important. Because if you are motivated, if you like what you do, you do it much better, right? So, up, oh, I'm running out of time, I think, and I cannot move to the next slide. Yeah. So thank you very much. Normally you can ask me questions, so that's the next five minutes. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Benoit. Thanks for that. Uh, I'll take one question, burning question from the audience, uh, both physical and uh, on the streaming, which will be typed on the chat. Uh, any burning question for Benoit? From here? No? I think it was all clear. Well, thank, thank you. you very much. We'll move on. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you. So moving on to our uh, second company, I'm happy to introduce uh, Mark from Eura. Um, they have been around uh, for a while now and uh, without further ado, I'll leave it to him to explain you what they do. And uh, later you will also be able to taste maybe some of their products. Amazing, thank you.
Good evening, everyone. Who from here hasn't tasted the Euro products yet? Okay. So we are in present in all the supermarkets in Spain minus Mercadona. You will see a photo of a pack there. So, and I encourage you to taste the, the future of food. Thank you very much. So, well, first of all, it's, it's a pleasure to be in the top 10 list, really. And I think that kudos to the whole team that it's creating the value and the impact that enables that to happen. Today, I would like to share a little bit with you why the future of food has to be food tech. And in a week no, of the Mobile World Congress, where we are talking a lot about of technology, I think that it's relevant to understand that one of the biggest challenges of the world will be solved through food tech, and we are not talking enough about that. And a lot of people know a lot about Eura through the communication that we do, through our brand or, or Good Rebels community. And today I want to share more about what's the, te the tech behind the products and, and how is our vision moving forward in order to keep improving and bringing more delicious products that will be transformative into the market. So everything... Web Amazing. Thank you. So I think that something that makes Eura unique is that we start with the mission towards the action. And, and we understand that we have a North Star that it's how to build a net positive food system. And at the end, it means giving more than what we take, understanding that profit it's just a result of stakeholders that we have to take care of like society the, the entire food system the animals and and the environment and also how we accelerate the most important transition that has to happen in this century that is the protein transition so so something really relevant we already know about the sustainability impact about the food system to to refresh some important data that we need to understand at the end when we look at the consumer goods industry it's the industry that is having the most impact but we look at the global greenhouse emissions more than 34 percent of the global greenhouse emissions are coming from the food system and from there animal agriculture is the leading cause for that and it has a lot to do with the feasibility and how it's not a technology and a model and a system that can allow us to scale consumption in order to make sure that everyone can keep enjoying the foods that we do forever we have an issue there no but something that we don't talk as much as right now in western civilization one of the biggest causes of that it's linked to health cardiovascular disease that it's super linked to nutrition or currently we are consuming as society much more calories than what we should do and it has to do with the types of foods and processed foods that we are eating right now where there is a huge abundance in our diets of simple carbohydrates and fats we have to take into account that for one gram we have nine kilocalories kilocalories when it comes to fats but when it comes to proteins or fibers we are talking of four and two and at the end when we look at the carbohydrates that we are taking and, and, and the fats, uh, they are more or less satiant than fibers and proteins that in case of fibers we are not taking enough in, in our diets. So there, there is sometimes when talking about food tech uh, a debate about natural versus processed and I really love this debate because at the end it shows that we are looking at that from the cultural lenses of our of, of our current habits because there is something super processed that everyone is consuming every day that it's water and thank God that it's processed for our health Be because of not we will have a lot of disease that luckily thanks of progress and technology we overcome as society so at the end in order to make sure that the whole world can access and nutritional di dense diets and balanced diets processed food will be playing a, a clear role to that and the important part is the nutrition density of the products which kind of, of food industry are we creating creating products that are nutrition dense so they are good process for our diets and they are having impact in helping us to have more balanced diets 
or not? And I think that this is the quick question that, that we should uh, make happen, no? And, and the way that we are approaching that with understanding that the protein transition doesn't have to be an alternative, but just successors, is what is pushing forward the success and, and the recognition that Eura is having. That in a moment of inflation, and in a moment where there are a lot of bad products in, into the market that are not matching the expectations of the consumers, and therefore they are not repeating again in, in being part of this transition, what we are seeing is that this value proposition of, of successors, it, it's helping to bring people together despite of this, the inflation and any naysayers or uh, certain articles that right now are, are in the press, uh, like uh, when 20 years ago they said that the internet will be just a fad. So how are we doing that happen? So at, at the end, we are super focused in making excellent products happen. And how we can measure that a product is excellent? Well, consumer is and, and the people that purchase it, if they repeat it, it shows that it's a good product and we have a lot, a lot to improve. But we are seeing right now in, in, in Spain that we are getting to a repeat rates that are an anomaly in the category and this is something really good to celebrate. So, how are we making that happen? And this, today we will unfold a part, a part of the magic. At the end, Everything is about the microstructure design and how you are creating matrix in order to allow certain interactions and for that you need to know a lot of scientific understanding about the ingredients but today something that Eura wants to push forward in order to develop this industry fa faster is to pay more attention in the ingredient interactions and how the processes of these ingredients impact in the whole result on the structure and we will be seeing that in data no? but in order to create matrix of structures and microstructures, what, what we are combining are proteins with proteins, proteins with lipids, and these structures with cations and certain uh, minerals that are helping us to get to that, to that structure. But why does this is, is relevant? Because sometimes we simplify a lot in food tech talking about ingredients, but ingredients alone wouldn't help us to achieve the results. And I think that this is a great example no, about category colleagues that focus in replicating the molecular structure of casing, but at the end we have to understand that in order to develop certain fun functionalities and mouthfeels, what we need is to create the, the interactions that will create the microstructures that will allow that to happen. Because right now we are getting these casings, but we are using the same amount of starches and hydrocolloids that is not solving the problem. Because we are able to replicate a product, but not get to the, to the functionalities that will allow us to have a more nutrition dense product. And at the end, how we make that the nutritional dense ingredients, so fibers and proteins are taking most of the space of the formulation instead of modified starches or hydrocolloids. So in order to do that, I think that the magic of Eura resides in its people, in everything that we do. And expanding the view from an interdisciplinary approach to a transdisciplinary approach, where we are not bringing together only people of, with know-how of different fields, but creating new things, thanks of the orchestration of, of this know-how. And we are talking here about colloids, emulsions, proteins, mathematics, rheology, and fluid mechanical um, models. So this is the team that is allowing to create all this concept that I'm sharing to you that then lands into the products that we do. Because it's amazing that how we have revolutionized the nutritional dense part of the product while delivering an amazing sensorial experience. And right now, what we are seeing in, in, in the category and, and, and meat is that we are putting different ingredients together but not, not designing the microstructure in a way that will help us to recreate the experience that we want. Because for example, there, there are, right now, you can use a saturated fat and put 20 grams in a burger, but you can also design the emulsions in order to make sure that the release of juiciness, instead of happening in the pan, 
will happen in your mouthfeel. And this is what allows us to have this nutritional density, this protein density, and, and this Nutri-Score nutri A in, in the whole portfolio of Eura, while at the same time uh, achieving an amazing, uh, an amazing sensorial experience. And, and not only we are talking about the protein density of a product, but bringing more fiber that it's something that it's also very apart from, from our diets. And when it comes to sensory, right now, when we are already doing a neurophysiological study, in the way that we are also creating the microstructures, we are not getting just a pace with our burger, but a crumble experience that with brain response is showing that the taste is already better than a, a burger that, that had the structure, uh, the nutritional structure that I, I was sharing before. There are a lot of, of challenges ahead, and, and this will be an amazing year for getting up to the list to next year because in April we will be sharing with to the wall our first pattern. Everything that I share right now goes in our ways of working and our trade secrets. But not only, no, we are changing the way of how the design of products was, was doing, but this year we are going to break a barrier of how you can create these interactions and how we can stop to rely to ingredients that are not helping us to achieve the nutritional density and the, familiar, the familiarity that the consumer is looking for. And, and this is going to be unfolded in, in April. And at the same time, when we talk about nature, whoppa, na nature positive, we are doing an amazing job in in, in offsetting already or, or emissions, having science-based target to, to reduce the, the average C, uh, CO2 per, per kilo of product. But there are big opportunities in order to bring breakthrough technologies to the value chains to make them impact positive from, from their inception and their production. And, and that's something that we will be unfolding next year. So thank you very much for your attention. I thought that you know that Today, you get to know a little bit more about the food tech and the tech behind Eura, and without doubt, the, the protein transition will be bigger than all the renewals. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, we're going to skip to the next one. You're going to stick around, so anyone who has burning questions for Mark, you can grab it maybe later. Uh, moving on, as... Uh, we have quite a bit of content still and in two more companies you know, to, to cover. I'm going to call Alejandro from Groots, who's going to unveil a bit more about their solution uh, in the vertical farming space. OK. Thank you. Good evening, all. Uh, first of all, it's an honor to be here. We're not as big as Eura, but we're making our steps. OK. Uh, sorry. Not my company. <laughs> Okay, so my name is Alejandro Roda Gomez. I'm going to talk about agricultural transition to vertical farming. Uh, first, we'll see the problems with an S because agriculture has a lot of problems currently. Uh, the challenge that we have in the future, a solution we propose, and how we can see the future to this. Okay, so first, the current problems. So agriculture is lagging behind. It's a very inefficient system. It has a, a high exposure to climate change. It's actually the sector that will be most impacted by climate change. It's a, it has a high balance between the supply and demand. As demand increases, the supply decreases. It consumes most of the fresh water we have in, in the planet. Uh, completely, <laughs> for sure, the first factor in deforestation and soil degradation. A very inefficient supply chain we have. Uh, basil from Mo Spain being sold in the UK and basil from Morocco being sold in Spain and basil from the Horn of Africa being sold in Morocco, etc. And uh, the use of pesticides, which is uh, a big hurdle on the soil, the water and our oil systems. So we are seeing already uh, the impact of climate change and of, of course of many diverse factors on food prices. Uh, there's been an increase of 35% in food prices since 2022. Uh, sorry, since 2020. Uh, it's been ob obviously driven by the war, but climate change is already having its, its impact on food prices. It is the, also the main cause of uh, global greenhouses. It's 20% uh, of, well, 
all sectors claim they are the main cause, but food production is the main and the number one source of environmental degradation. And the future doesn't look good at all. So, wait, there we go. So the climate crisis is first and foremost a food climate, a food crisis. Uh, the four horsemen of uh, climate change, drought, floodings, fire, and extreme heat, will have a direct impact on, on, on agriculture productivity. So last year, we had a very terrifying sneak peek of what climate change will be, and only at 1.1 degrees Celsius. We had mega droughts all around the world. We had the worst drought in, in the Mediterranean since recorded history, in China, in the Horn of Africa, in the Western USA, in all major agricultural uh, zones of the planet. We had the floodings in Europe as well, in East Asia, big floodings, uh, uh, the fires that make all the news, and extreme heat. So you cannot grow food without water. You cannot grow food and harvest in extreme heat. And definitely you cannot harvest if your uh, crop is flooded or in, on fire. So we have a big, big problem. This is just the beginning. And moreover, population is increasing. So we'll have less uh, supply and a higher, higher demand. So a, a great imbalance here. So we have the challenge of feeding a growing population in a healthy way, uh, respecting the planetary boundaries and protected from climate variability. This is precisely the challenge that was uh, foreseen by the AAT Lancet Commission. It was a great uh, commission put up by the AAT Lancet uh, with experts in nutrition and environment to define the best diet for, for both the planet and, and, and ourselves. So at the end, they defined that we need a new food production system that uses no additional land, safeguards existing biodiversity, uh, is moreover more efficient in water use and less contaminant all over. So a food production system that uses less land, less water, and protects crops from high climatic variability. So there's where we enter. So we propose a solution. I say a solution because I don't believe that vertical farming is the silver bullet solution to solve all of the problems I mentioned before. It is part of a system of solutions, and it's, it is as we have to embrace it. Okay, so what do we do? We do vertical farming. Vertical farming, I guess, most of you have already known about it. It's uh, a name with many faces, but it's basically growing up instead of uh, outwards. That's, uh, there are many combinations of vertical farms. What we do is a system, a combination of three systems. We combine a hydroponic system, which saves a lot of water and, and nutrients. We combine, we do this in vertical uh, growth towers to increase the yields per square meter. And we do this in a controlled environment, which I think is the most important aspect for climate adaptation. So uh, you will see many vertical companies with different systems. We use one in which we first grow the towers in uh, stacked layers, uh, the, sorry, the plants in stacked layers. And then as they increase their density and they need more space, more room to grow, to grow uh, we move them into towers. Uh, there are many different approaches to this. I think it's a very comp uh, like evolutionary uh, aspect. You will see the best uh, succeed. We, this increases our sustainability and our efficiency a lot. So we produce the same in one hectare as uh, 50 times in traditional agriculture. Uh, we use 97% less water, 94% less, uh, sorry, 94% less water. Uh, all this emitting 25% less greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of lettuce and 360 days constant production. We are protected from storms, from Philomena, from droughts, from heat waves. It's very uh, like a double-edged knife. We help in mitigation and we help in, in adaptation. Moreover, we can increase the flavor and the nutrition value of the plants because as we control all the variables of the growth of the plant, we can optimize what we decide, either the growth or the nutritious value. Okay, so it's food free from deforestation, soil contamination, water contamination, pesticides, long supply chains. We have the farm here at 30 kilometers from Barcelona. Food waste as products last longer both in the supermarkets and in the fridges. Fossil fuels, very important, which is one of the biggest drivers of the price increase as well lately, and climate variability. Okay, 
So we are by now the biggest vertical farming company in Spain. We've been around for four years. Uh, we have uh, revenues last year of 700K, still far from the top 10 in the food tech uh, 500, but we are getting there. We're selling in most uh, retail companies in, in Spain, in, in Catalonia, and now growing into other areas. What do we sell? Well, for now we're selling herbs mostly and greens. This is lettuce, basil, or top product, mint, and else. And we also combine with other companies with that share our values and philosophy of a food transition for the first vegan ready-to-eat salad. Uh, what about the future? So we are working on different crops. We believe that herbs is only the beginning. Uh, we're working with a beer company producing hops. Hops is the flower that gives the flavor to, to beer. And it's a crop that is highly impacted by climate change. Uh, we are growing also some medicinal flowers for, for pain relief. We're working on some projects to increase the robotics in our system and increase the efficiency um, with some AE by a subsidized project. What we're seeing is that the future is bright for vertical farming, even though right now the present uh, status of capital investment is a bit complicated. But our, all of our main costs are decreasing. Uh, LED lights are increasing in efficiency and they are decreasing in cost. Sensors are decreasing in cost and electricity, which is the main, main factor for our success, is decreasing, even though lately it's been with some changes. In the contrary, traditional agriculture has all their costs increasing. Land cost is increasing, fertilizer cost is increasing, and water is becoming more and more scarce and complicated. Here in Spain, we already see it's almost a political issue. Okay. So as I said before, herbs is the beginning. Then we have uh, many crops that have already been tested in vertical farming. The question is about profitability. When will these crops be grown in vertical farms? When they are profitable enough. So it's both a question of price and electricity. Okay, thank you all. And if you have any questions, I'm here for that. Thank you very much, Alejandro. He's also going to stick around here for a little longer. So any burning questions that you guys may have, uh, feel free to grab him during the networking session. And last but not least, uh, we're going to go back to Alternative Protein. And uh, let me just, uh, without further ado, introduce you to Miguel from uh, Nova Meat. Uh, they take a different approach to producing uh, cold cuts and, and other type of uh, Alternative Protein products. So without further ado, Okay, hi uh, guys, uh, my name is Miguel Angelo de Oliveira. I am the COO for Nova Meat. Nova Meat is a uh, startup here in Barcelona. I can, get, I can get right in front of my pictures so everybody can see me. Um, uh, we are a startup here in Barcelona and we believe we have developed the next generation technology that will enable the creation of muscle-like protein structures from any edible protein that ultimately enables us to produce whole cuts, which we believe is the way that Nova Meat can impact um, our carbon footprint and biodiversity. And that can be done because we can develop the products that will ultimately allow more people to eat plant-based protein products. Right now, I think we are, uh, in a way, bound to burgers and sausages. Uh, and breaking into that uh, whole muscle uh, opportunity, I think, is the way that we get everybody to move away from meats to plant-based proteins, which is, right now, the easiest and most effective way to reduce our carbon footprint. Uh, it's not the tastiest yet, but it's coming. Uh, let's see. So Nova Meat started with the 3D printing, uh, and that's how we understood how the small fibers inside each protein uh, muscle bundle works. And out of that uh, technology that was created by our, our founder, uh, Giuseppe Chonti, we have uh, in understood how to create that matrix. And right now, we took that knowledge and moved 
from a 3D printer on a bench to a actual commercial facility that we have here in Barcelona. We call it our market development unit, an MDU, where we have been able to take the technology that was working, creating small stakes at 100 grams per hour to a commercial big machine adapted from the meat industry that is producing micro texture that muscle structure at hundreds of kilos an hour. We already have uh, demonstrated up to 500 kilos an hour of production. The, the main issue now is that having cleared that step of the production, we now have the downstream processing. In a way now I run the production facility, the, the production machine for about two minutes every hour and then it takes me 58 minutes of 16 PhDs working as operators to get that done. And uh, do not try to run a production facility with PhDs. Uh, they, they complain a lot and they have lots of opinions about everything. So, you know, discussing why this, why not that? So everybody does that. So we are running, uh, we have adapted our uh, MDU. We are approved by the Spanish authority to produce and sell uh, plant-based products throughout Europe. And we are expanding our network of contacts and people where we are introducing product. There are a few stealth restaurants in Barcelona selling our product since October of last year with uh, very good success and track record. We hope to have more product in the market by the summer and we are trying to be a B2B company. You will not see Nova Meat products in supermarkets. We believe we are a platform to enable the whole industry. We are uh, protein agnostic, so the technology that we develop works with any protein, any edible protein, uh, be that from plants, be that from cell base, and we have tried everything, uh, you know, some of the new proteins that are coming out, they are great from a nutrition standpoint, they are great from a composition standpoint, but they do not have structure. They are coming out of the soup in a reactor, and we, have, we believe we have created the technology that will enable those proteins to become part of muscles that can be eaten happily and people can smile while doing that rather than remember some past experience 25 years ago eating soy proteins uh, that I used to make. Uh, here is, a, is a, our chicken filet. You can actually see some of the structure of how the muscle fibers are put together. That structure and the way that we create creates space for uh, for sauces and things, so when you're cooking it, it actually absorbs what you're cooking them in rather than the other way around, and all that comes out when you eat it. Um, we also have a um, pool chicken, which is actually what is left when we do the chicken fillet. So having an old guy running their operations is a good thing because you know you have to reduce waste all the time. Uh, here's the pool meat. The pool meat, uh, we just got the LCA for this. It's 3.5 kilos equivalent of CO2 for kilo. And compare that to 50-50 pork and beef mix sold in the UK. That's about uh, 10. So we're one third of the LCA for uh, equivalent meat. And then uh, our pastrami, uh, cooperation with a meat company that took our big chunks of meat and made it into pastrami. Highly success. We do not have any samples because I ate them all today. Uh, we had a little piece left, but that went for lunch. Uh, it, will be, it will be soon sold by that partner, which is the B2B approach. We enabled them to have a product in the market using our materials. And then uh, the beef, which is still working. We're trying to get the, the marbling thing going and it's taking a little longer than normal. And the last one, the team. I, I improved, or actually I increased the average age by three years when I joined the company. Uh, and kind of a, but it's, it's a good thing that they have uh, an, a, an older guy that knows some of the things. Like Romario, uh, the soccer player, when he was playing at 43, at 43 years of age, they asked him, how can you play? You know, you're running against 18 year olds. I said, I only go after the good balls. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Miguel. And uh, 
it also adding a little bit of a of a humor here, uh, as I know that the smell of food now is uh, probably ingrained into your your nose, and uh, you can't wait any longer to actually get your your hands on it. But before we get into that, I just wanted to uh, we're going to run a very brief uh, panel discussion with other companies that actually we still think you know they're heroes in the in this year food tech 500 and they're still very representative of uh, uh, the spanish ecosystem and to do that as i've been speaking quite a bit i'm going to introduce you to my partner in crime max who is going to be telling you a bit more about what we've seen over the last 10 years working in this space but most and foremost is going to then moderating also the whole panel without further ado please max join me thank you ali you, you do talk a lot indeed <laughs> So, um, before I introduce the, the, the panelists, just going to say a few years more, but not about the past 10 years, because we, we're running out of time, but just the past year. Uh, it's, it's a good start. Uh, as you know, for many reasons that have been mentioned uh, by some of the speakers, uh, 2022 has been kind of a rough year for, for food tech, for venture capital in general, for many sectors. Um, for example, um, uh, we just kind of like flush a few points that we think are um, the key ones to, to retain for, for the past year, for 2002, if the clicker decides to work. Yeah. Here we go. Uh, so first of all, as I mentioned before, it's been a tough year for venture capital, but that was, food tech was no exception to that. So if you look at the numbers, for example, like almost half uh, less investment went into uh, the food tech market in 2022 compared to 2021, which was kind of crazy uh, in terms of, it was a record year, but uh, we went from 49 billion invested to 30 billion uh, in, just, in just one year. As a, as a consequence of that, uh, help clicker issue again. No, here we go. Uh, valuations obviously have been quite affected. Um, and uh, in our projections, we, uh, I can't remember the exact number, but a lot comp many companies that were supposed to actually go IPO in 2022 kind of like pulled out uh, last year. Uh, and obviously when we talk about valuations, we talk about a number of unicorns uh, in the sector. So in 2021, uh, we saw 35 new unicorns uh, reaching that status against only nine uh, in 2022 in the, in the, in, at, at the global scale. Also, we've seen a lot of, uh, especially I would say three, four months ago, a lot of news about investors having doubts about the size, the actual size of the uh, plant-based protein markets. Um, I got a lot of people in this room who <laughs> definitely argue about that. Um, I do argue about that as well. Um, but for example, you know, we've seen the, the, the stock value of Beyond Meat and all the like crushing down by more than 70% after being introduced in the market. Uh, some more news at corporate level, like for example, GBS uh, pulling out uh, their brand uh, Plantera Foods from, from the market. Um, we do believe that it's just a matter of like calibration. Uh, I think valuations were far too high. Maybe these companies in the first place, talking about Beyond and, and Alto, were probably overvaluated when they entered the market. So I think 2022 has been kind of like a tipping point, a turning point in the whole sector. And I think we do are going towards a more kind of like um, healthy adjustments uh, in, in the sector. The next point uh, is about how the protein, alternative protein landscape is also changing. Um, from in, historically from plant-based, and that started in 2021, we're seeing a lot more investment going towards cellular agriculture and protein fermentation. So 2021 was the first year when actually when you put together um, fermentation and cell-based, there was more investment going into these two subsectors uh, compared to plant-based, and that was the exact same thing uh, in 2022 with 1.1 billion for plant-based versus 1.4 billion invested uh, in cellular agriculture and, and precision fermentation. And that's also kind of like a, a natural evolution about how products are evolving themselves. And right now, to actually reach more consumers, um, we need to make these products more scalable, uh, better in terms of taste, better in terms of texture, um, better in terms of clean level, which is why companies like, like Hura and, and, and you know, Nova Meat as well, you know, are leveraging different technologies, uh, leveraging different ingredients and different technologies such as precision fermentation to actually reach this new level for alternative protein products. Uh, and last but not least, we do see that 
we've been seeing you know a lot of news about uh, layoff, uh, especially in some very um, capex intensive sectors like uh, vertical farming, like uh, food delivery as well. Uh, quite a few companies shutting down as well in the past uh, in the past few months. We do believe, unfortunately, that you know when when we think about vertical farming, you know the surge in uh, energy costs, for example, uh, has been quite impactful uh, for them. Um, we don't think that is going to change any anytime soon. So 2023, 2023 might be a, a rough year for uh, for these subsectors as well, and we're going to see a lot more kind of like consolidation happening, a lot more M&A acquisitions in in, in these sectors. Um, so now, I'd like to welcome on stage the last uh, four speakers for tonight for a quick conversation about how the sector is going to evolve. We do believe, we're quite optimistic about how it's going to evolve, but we might have some different views there. Let's, let's get comfortable. We have to pass the mic. Ladies first. <laughs> and, and by the way, they're all part of this year's ranking. I'm just too, too, but we couldn't fit anyone for, for pitches, but we're going to be able to, to taste some of their products uh, right, right after. We're getting to food, don't worry about it. So, first off, guys and ladies. Uh, Luz, we'll start with you. If you could all introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about what, what, your, company, uh, what your company does. Okay, thank you for inviting me to this event. It's always a pressure to be here. I'm Luz, and I am the CEO and co-founder of Baca. In Baca, we create and design high-quality plant-based cheese with innovative ingredients. Uh, right now, we are using um, plant-based milk from melon seeds. Uh, and we are mixing tradition with technologies and values of this century. Well, thank you for inviting me. I am Juan Pablo, I am the CEO and co-founder of Inomi. We have a biotech company who provides solutions to the food industry using the technology of mycelia. Uh, we, we are focused in this moment to create a new alternative protein, a fungi protein, with the inputs of the some kind of uh, factories, like beer factories, so we feed our mushroom with the with the inputs. Hello, I'm Mariano Otto from Nucaps Nanotechnology. Uh, we are a biotech company in, in Navarra, and we uh, design and produce functional ingredients, a new category with a micro encapsulation using food proteins. We can uh, improve uh, health through nutrition with a clean label solution just using fruit, uh, food ingredients and uh, to reduce salt, reduce sugar and uh, improve uh, the health of the, of the food. Hi everybody, um, my name is Kyle Sherrill and I'm with Libre Foods. Um, I'm not a co-founder nor CEO. Our CEO is currently out of town, but I'm um, leading some of the market expansion. Um, and we create uh, here at Libre a, um, a couple different products that are based on the mycelium and mushroom, uh, the beautiful fungi kingdom as well. Um, so really excited. Amazing, thank you guys. So the first question for all of you, um, I've been talking right, be right before that about you know, the challenges that the, factor, the, the sector is facing currently. Like, I would like to ask you to direct the questions to, to your company specifically as you've been you know, uh, not necessarily founding the company but you've been there for quite some time. What is the biggest challenge you've been facing as, as a company and what do you think is the biggest challenges that the food tech sector is, is going to be facing in the years, the years to come? That's a tough one. Um, I think for Libre, uh, as we are beginning to expand our product portfolio and our product offering, um, really making sure that our, our marketing messaging um, is appealing to not just kind of the core vegan vegetarian segment, but also the flexitarians and kind of the traditional consumers as well. Um, and then for, for food tech more generally, um, I think, you know, convincing these consumers who are not kind of the, the, the classic apostles of, um, of uh, vegan and vegetarianism, um, how, to, how to get them on board. Yes, definitely uh, our, yes, our challenge is to bring tasty products uh, at a good price to not only for vegan people, but for everyone. That's uh, scaling the production and reaching these clients. Well, in our case, is the um, 
because of the we use uh, sign new kind of mushrooms, the, the regulation is always a, a big challenge for us. But well, that is something that most of these companies have to to pass. Um, I can think that in the in general the the over the offer of new solutions for the behavior of the new customer is is a little is going to be a challenge. Okay, for the caps, the challenge is uh, to grow, and for as most Spanish startups, is uh, is a it's a complicated way to to grow to. Uh, uh, stop g being a startup and being a company. And for the food tech uh, industry, I think the challenges are, are, are many, but uh, it's, uh, I'm very positive on the future of uh, food tech. Uh, we need uh, tasty food, sustainable food, clean level food, and healthy food, and all at a cost. But we do have the technologies now for doing that. It is uh, not just a solution, it's a combination of solutions of different industries, and I think that uh, the, the challenge. And the uh, reduced cost. Uh, we are in food industry. Things, uh, food has to be cheap or affordable at last. Okay. Thanks, Rob, and thanks. Actually, what you said earlier was, was a good transition. You mentioned like uh, you need, what you struggle is to grow. Um, my question is more about kind of like the support from the ecosystem in terms of like new investors, accelerators, government organizations, talking about regulation, for example, like what would you say, have you seen any kind of like progress in that perspective, like since you created a company in terms of like the support that you can get externally? Um, well, um, I think that this is growing a lot, the, the, the support of the investors and the actually the fact that we are a B2B company and we talk with that several traditional um, factories, food factories, and they are open now. And the last three years, they, are, they were everybody closed. So this is very nice, the, 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 this moment. But well, there are some places that go faster than like the factories and the, and, but the other areas like regulation are goes slower. <laughs> so for me, it's like that. I think we, we are improving in, the, in Spain, but we are quite uh, far away from the open innovation systems here on, on, in, in Europe and, uh, and other countries. Uh, for the moment, it's just a nice wish to have an open innovation in, in, in for Spanish uh, companies and startups. And uh, the support from uh, corporates, investors, and uh, hubs uh, may, may be too much. I think there are many investors with their funds many accelerators and hubs more than startups, <laughs> and many mentors without expertise. So I think the, 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 there's a, a, a slight bubble about food tech, okay. from my point of view. Okay. I think that we really need uh, also the support from the government in terms of polit politics for food. We are offering solutions, we are putting so much effort into making new products, and when we, yes, when we arrive to the client or to the shelf, we are competing with animal-based pros who has less taxes and support and grants and everything. And we, we cannot compete exactly in price. And then also the buyers, sometimes they are not so, so open to innovation or they are not understanding why we, our products are uh, so, higher so, in terms of So what of price. do you think is needed to educate <laughs> the buyers? The, the buyers, I, I was t talking about the buyers in the supermarket, but the, I think the clients are growing in that sense. The, we need more education for sure, but I think the people is uh, buying these products. So the plant-based sector is growing. So if we combine these people, these investors, these hubs, amazing hubs, uh, with pol politicians, uh, politics for food, and also supermarkets that are open into innovation, we have the solution, I think. Any, any buyers in the room? By the way? <laughs> no, hopefully everybody is safe. Um, I guess I'll just point out two, I guess, ecosystem actors. I know ecosystems is a very fuzzy word, um, and I think it's hard. I, it's why forward fooding is really amazing, is it's pinpointing some of these actors and connecting them. Um, I'd like to see a lot more um, kind of investment upstream from government 
especially in the regulation, um, funding some R&D around um, kind of the really tough capital intensive R&D side of things. Um, and then further downstream, I think uh, we need corporates to get a little bit more involved for their own benefit in the innovation side of things, um, but also support some of these startups who are looking for um, where they want to go after their you know, Series C, Series B. Um, not everyone's maybe poised for an IPO, and there, there's a lot of great corporate opportunities there, I think. And so to top on that, Mariano, you mentioned there were too many accelerators, <laughs> too many investors. Like what, what, how different should it be? Like how do you, these programs should be structured to be really, really efficient? No, I, I, I love to have a lot of uh, uh, spaces where to talk about our company and, and to, to be known. But in some, in some uh, times, uh, there are a lot of uh, events and exhibitions at the same time. And we are um, most, most of the time the same companies in, the, in those events. Uh, what I mean is that, um, that the ecosystems uh, has a, a, a space, a big space between uh, startups and academia and the, and the corporates. And maybe we startups are making a mistake trying to, to work with co corporates. Maybe uh, uh, SMI, SMIs and uh, small companies, local heroes, should be our partner, not the corporates. Because uh, they are uh, too slow, they are too big, they have no the motivation for making innovation in the product. They do have the market, they are selling it at all. So I think cooperation between, between startups and SMEs maybe is uh, the better way for putting the technology into market the fastest way. Do you want to top that maybe? No? No? <laughs> um, a side question, not, not exactly related, but in, in the past few months as well, past year, I'd say there's a lot of talks about AI. You know, it's kind of like a big buzzword here. And AI, when we talk about food techs, can be applied to a lot of things from, you know, biotech and seed genetics to uh, supply chain tracking, whatever. Uh, in your case, like, are you leveraging any types of AI in your company? Uh, well, in, my, in our case, it's a science company. Uh, um, well, I don't understand really well what, uh, what I'm doing. It's doing my, my bio uh, informatic guy. But I think that he's working with this. <laughs> that's it. That's at the end. I think that he's always making statistics, uh, really close, uh, hard statistics. And in this area, it's a very big tool. Um, but in our, uh, I've, this is particular for, for, for us. But in general, I, I can imagine a lot of uh, um, tools for, for, the, for the startups. I don't know yet how we can use. Yes, we are working with a, with a partner in, in Navarra. And the, we are studying the microbiota of uh, patients with, uh, from, with cancer and seeing uh, what's missed on that uh, microbiota to see what uh, they need to be supplemented with food, uh, with the prebiotics and probiotics they, they need. And they are, they are working on, uh, yeah, you know, on that. Yes, we have a project. Uh, we are developing a project to reach the perfect fit between substrate and microorganisms in order to create better texture and flavors for cheese. And it's one of our, yes, using uh, artificial intelligence. So we're not using right now, but it's on the horizon. I think one of our main R&D and kind of scientific development activities is strain selection um, and kind of optimization. And so AI, we, we feel is going to be really helpful for that um, kind of in the near term. And going back one step again, like um, if you can like exclude your own field of expertise, are there any particular technologies within the whole food tech spectrum that you think are going to have a big impact on our, on our food system? I love fermentation, and uh, not only precise fermentation, but also fermentation. And mycelium, I, I love it, the, the idea to grow. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, I'm surrounded by it. Yeah, we have to talk. <laughs> uh, for us, it's about the, the scale up of some kind of fermentation. We are making solid fermentation as always a challenge because the industry is not working so much in this area, so we have to create the, the, the tools and all the machinery. Um, well, in, we, we love to have more offer in this area. You don't have <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, previous last question almost. Um, when we talk about you know, changing our food system and about the future, we always talk about change, change, change. What, what do we need to change? I, in your own opinion, I will turn the question around and ask you, like, what do you think is not going to change anytime soon and shouldn't change? 
and shouldn't and shouldn't change. Hmm. Okay. Um, one thing that comes <laughs> one thing that comes to mind um, is the idea about like center of plate for consumers. So I think there's still this idea, you know, you need a, a big a big chunk of something in the middle of your plate, whether it's protein or meat or a burger. Um, and I think that's holding us back a little bit from kind of innovating around what food and food technology can be. Um, I don't know if I'm the right person to say whether that's right or wrong, but uh, I think that's something that uh, is, is holding back the industry a little bit. Well, I think people is going to steal it in the future, <laughs> definitely, and look for tasty products. Yes, and um, for me it's the same. Um, the more carnival people, I feel that they're going to be in this area, but we have we have to play with the with the others. But it's, we we are not going to see the people who love meat to change so fast. I for me they say that. What I think is not going to change is that food is not only food; it's uh, experience, it's uh, social. It's something we, we like to do and we like to do with other people. So taste and uh, healthiness, something they are demanding, but do not forget uh, the price and the, and, the, and, the, and the experience. Great point. Thank you all. Last question uh, before we move to, back to food, really. This time I'm not lying. No. <laughs> it smells bacon since earlier. Um, your piece of advice for uh, any kind of like new entrepreneurs, wannabe entrepreneurs out there, like if you take a look back at your own journey, like what would you do, no. what would you do differently? Do you, you want to start? <laughs> the one, the one non-CEO co-founder here, you want me to start? <laughs> no, no, no. Courage, animals. So you have to be brave, you have to, yes, into uh, finding solutions and having everyday problems to solve and to focus on your mission. <laughs> yes, that, that could be very interesting to have a mission and, 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 and don't think about the, all the noise that you are going to, to find in the way because you have to believe on you and, and go ahead. <laughs> That's very important. The team is going to say don't work with corporate. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> the team is, is very important and uh, to take care of your team, have a very good team that uh, make, uh, make uh, everything happens. Uh, we have uh, six uh, female doctors on the top of our company and we are having four childs in two years. And uh, they are still promoting and they are still uh, making possible the being, uh, having a child and being a uh, 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 chief of uh, invest, uh, um, research and, and development, and that's very important. They, they are part of the company. They are new caps. They are feeling new caps. They believe in what they are doing. I think that that's very important for making things happen. I'll close it. Um, I think uh, I think the team is super important. I think for me, I've worked at a couple different startups before. Um, the thing that really amazes me about Libre, and I'm sure about all of your teams as well, is is the culture and building the culture super early, um, and that carrying through kind of your company and it aligns to your mission and values and all those things. Um, yeah. Thank you. A lot, a lot of different like interesting concepts and talking points from regulation, adoption, everything. Uh, we have time maybe for a couple of questions, if there are any in the room. I think everyone's starving now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm quite intrigued and by, by the mycelium movement. Um, it's more recent. I love mushrooms, but uh, I think it's a bit more complicated than that. So it would be interesting to, to know what it brings to the table compared to the existing alternative protein, which were based on soy and stuff like that. It's interesting to understand uh, from a scientific and consumer, is it more taste, is it the health? It's true that there are research that mushrooms are good for the brain, there are more and more knowledge, but even the very old food that we've been eating for centuries, we don't know even the health impact totally. So I'm curious what's the value proposition um, and what do you think it will bring on health benefits especially? Yeah, I can start. Um, in, terms of, in terms of mushrooms, like you mentioned, the health benefits I think are, are pretty well understood, but uh, we only can consume a, a small percentage of mushrooms that are currently in fungi that are currently like in the mushroom kingdom. Um, and I th actually think fungi 
are one of the most under leveraged, under researched, under utilized, um, both both natural resource as well as process, right? So they they take things and can decompose them, can transform them. And I think at Libre, we're we're interested in in the the fungi kingdom as as an end product, you know, with all these health benefits, um, but also as a process as well around the fermentation side of things. And I think that's really exciting um, when you can kind of bring those two things together. Uh, I guess another thing that we're looking at um, at Libre uh, is the mycelium network as a as a, like a fibrous texture structure, right? So being able to to leverage this pretty unique um, mycelium network, which doesn't really exist in the same way um, in other, in kind of the rest of the plant kingdom, um, to bring a new a new angle to the texture kind of problem within food tech. Uh, yes, and actually talking about the the nutritional values of mycelia, it's very it's really interesting because the mycelia or the or the fungi war is closer to the animals than the plants and they need a nitrogenous to change to protein um, and the protein of the fungi protein is closer to animal protein and it's better for for humans that's the one of the first things but then with the, with the with the mushroom kingdom you are adding all the antioxidant all the amino acids you don't have a cholesterol you have ergosterol that is better for for, for the, our body um, there are well, the fungi beta glucleins uh, improved our our uh, immunology. So there are several things that we can share to the to the to the final customers. Um, but it's always thinking on the focus if you want to make the, a prebiotic <laughs> or to sell a food. But it's 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 really interesting the all all the things that we can add to the to the to the food. Actually, we are working not only in change the protein, the, uh, uh, create a new alternative protein. We are working also in, in flowers to make functional flowers for all the bakery, for the pasta, and that kind of things are very interesting for improve the, the nutritional, nutritional value. All right, I think we're done. Thank you guys for joining again. And uh, yes, yes, it's time for food. Not yet, kidding. So um, before before we, we close the session, remember for especially for people online, thanks thanks again to them for for joining. But if you happen to travel in Europe, uh, we'll be doing a little tour in the next few weeks. Um, and now we're going to move to the the next room to actually try some products. Uh, some of them uh, we have been presenting today. Thank you again uh, for Celine and the uh, Economic Development Board of Singapore for, for joining us. I think most of them are actually eligible to move to Singapore. I think work with you guys so. A good thing, and we've, we've set up these little kind of like stickers to identify the type of uh, kind of like organization that you belong to and facilitate um, exchange. Fantastic, uh, guys! Thank you very much. We don't want to hold you back. I just wanted to share one final uh, big thank you to our team who makes uh, this possible. I know that it sounds uh, uh, like you know it's, it's granted that you know we thank them, but I have to say that the, all this. Uh, and all the work that goes behind this, it wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for them. So uh, I'm not going to mention that they know who they are and all the other people that have actually collaborated with us to bring the Foodtech 500 to life. Thanks also for coming down tonight and also for all the people who join us and enjoy uh, some tasty food. Cheers.
Thank you.